As you already saw in the previous part of this series, the German physiologist Karl von Voigt was interested in what way macronutrients are interchangeable in nutrition, and his studies in this particular domain were continued by one of his students, the German physiologist Max Rubner. Considered today the father of modern dietetics, Voigt realized that the metabolism in the body is not proportional to the combustibility of the substances outside the body. However, Rubner disagreed with Voigt's conclusions and argued that the exchange of energy predominates over the exchange of material and the form of human calorie intake is irrelevant to its effect on energy balance. Rubner proposed that different foods may replace one another, providing the human body with the same amount of energy in accordance with their caloric value as determined when burned in a calorimeter. For determining the energy value of macronutrients, Rubner placed various foodstuffs in a container where they were burned with other materials furnishing oxygen. The container in which the sample was burning was placed inside another container filled with water. As the substances from the inner container were burning, the heat was causing an increase in water's temperature, and Rubner determined the energy value of the analyzed substance by measuring the temperature difference. From the values determined with the help of the calorimeter, Rubner deducted the energy value of urine and feces, which he associated with the latent heat of the body, and, after averaging the values obtained for vegetable protein, meat, and casein, Rubner set the energy value of protein to 4.1 calories per gram. He did the same for fat by averaging the energy values of olive oil, animal fat, and butter fat, and for carbohydrates by averaging the energy values of starch, sucrose, glucose, and lactis, and he set an energy value of 9.1 calories per gram for fat and 4.1 calories per gram for carbohydrates. Rubner's studies crossed the Atlantic in the late 19th century, being brought to the U.S. by the American chemist Wilbur Olin Atwater. In 1869, soon after receiving his Ph.D. for studies on the chemical composition of corn, Atwater traveled to Germany to complete his postdoctoral studies in agricultural chemistry, where he worked closely with Karl Voigt and Max Rubner. In 1873, Atwater became professor of chemistry at Wesleyan University, Connecticut, and during 1882-1883, he returned to Germany to study the metabolism of mammals in Voigt's laboratory. In 1887, Atwater published in the Century magazine an article titled The Potential Energy of Food, in which he presented his adaptation to the German studies. Modern physical science has taught how to measure the potential energy in combustible materials, wrote Atwater. The apparatus used is called a calorimeter, and the energy is measured by the amount of heat produced in burning the substances with oxygen, the equivalent of the heat in terms of mechanical energy being quite definitely known. The amounts of potential energy in different food materials have been measured in this way. Chemists and physiologists have thought for a long while that when food is consumed in the body it must yield the same quantity of energy as when burned in the calorimeter. In both cases, it is burned with oxygen, although the process in the body is far less simple than in the calorimeter. Atwater also mentioned the fact that a number of years ago, Professor Frankland, of London, determined the heats of combustion of different food materials, and his results have since been taken by many chemists and physiologists as the standard for their fuel values when they are used for food, although with a certain amount of reserve, because of the lack of proof that the heat generated in the calorimeter is an accurate measure of the energy developed by the same materials in the body. However, Atwater further promoted Rubner's ideas, and, because in the USA was, and it still used the customary system of measurements, and because most of the lay public wasn't, and still isn't, familiar with the metric system, Atwater made some changes to the German unit of heat. He considered it impractical to use such huge values as resulted in Voigt's experiments, namely 2,250,000 calories per day for a fasting individual and 2,400,000 calories on a medium diet, so he converted the calorie to the U.S. traditional system of weights and measures, he cut three zeros in the process and rounded up the values. The calorie, which is the unit commonly employed in these calculations, is the amount of heat which would raise the temperature of a kilogram of water 1 degree centigrade, or a pound of water 4 degrees Fahrenheit, wrote Atwater. Instead of this unit of heat, we may use a unit of mechanical energy, for instance the foot-ton, which is the force that would lift one ton one foot. One calorie nearly corresponds to 1.53 foot-tons.
Thus, not even a decade after the French chemist and politician Marcelin Berthelot capitalized Clement's calorie and equaled it with 1,000 small calories, Atwater came up with a new unit of energy. The calorie, without capital C, and its equivalent in foot tons. The public quickly accepted the new word, and it is continuously used today throughout the world as the unit of energy released when the food is burned in the human body. Atwater turned his attention to calorimetry and received government funds to continue his studies in food energy and for building a large respiration calorimeter to study human metabolism. The apparatus was considered a dream project for the 19th century and was developed in collaboration with Edward Rosa, professor of physics at Wesleyan. With annual costs exceeding $10,000 in a period when the average income for an unskilled worker was around $120 per year, for a factory worker, approximately $300 per year, while a teacher was earning around $500 to $600 a year, Atwater's device aided studies in food analysis, dietary evolution, and work energy consumption. Starting in 1897, Atwater carried out human experiments in collaboration with Francis Benedict, his assistant in the Department of Chemistry at Wesleyan University. All their experiments were conducted based on the assumption that light muscular activity consists of running the wheel of a medical bicycle with no resistance. For moderately active muscular work, a fair amount of resistance was applied using the electrical brake, and the rider turned the wheel at a definite number of revolutions per minute for a stated period. In severe work, the resistance was kept the same, and the number of revolutions increased, or the resistance increased, and the revolutions kept the same, while for very severe work, either the resistance or the number of revolutions, or both, were further increased. As an interesting observation to Atwater's experiments, if a man sleeps eight hours per day, performs very severe muscular labor for eight hours, and the remaining eight hours of the day were devoted to going to and from work, eating, sitting, etc., corresponding, say, to six hours of rest and two hours of light muscular exercise, the daily energy expenditure would be 6,260 calories, meaning approximately 6,260,000 calories in Voigt's units of energy, or over three times the value of 2,000 calories used today for general nutrition advice. However, in reality, things are not so simple as Atwater and many other nutrition scientists believed. In fact, even Atwater realized that one important difference between the human body and the furnace or steam engine is that the former is self-building, self-repairing, and self-regulating. Another is that the material of which the engine is built is very different from that which it uses for fuel. But in the case of the body, part of the material which serves it for fuel also builds up and maintains the body tissue. Furthermore, if food is withheld, the body can, for some time, use its own substance for fuel. This the engine cannot do. Yet, instead of focusing on the material from which the self-building, self-repairing, and self-regulating human engine is built, and which is, mainly, the same substance considered by nutritionists to have zero calories, meaning water, Atwater continued his research based on the assumption that, when food is consumed in the body it must yield the same quantity of energy as when burned in the calorimeter. In both cases, it is burned with oxygen, although the process in the body is far less simple than in the calorimeter. Of course, we know today that the processes that take place in the human body are much more complex than those that take place in a calorimeter, and not far less simple as Atwater believed, and, despite hundreds of years of research, there's much to learn about our biology and the complexity of the human body. Yet, perhaps the biggest error Atwater did was that he compared the human body with a calorimeter, clearly violating thus the well-established principles of thermodynamics. And for you to realize what I mean, before we continue with the controversial history of the calorie, let's understand first some basic notions of thermodynamics. After all, the complexity of the human body, its general health and well-being, as well as its energy requirements, cannot be fully understood by taking into consideration the discoveries made in just one particular field of research, but only by connecting the knowledge that we have in all the other fields of science, including anatomy, physiology, physics, or chemistry. Thermodynamics is the branch of physical science that studies the relationship between heat or temperature and all the other forms of energy, including mechanical, electrical, or chemical energy. In other words, thermodynamics deals with the transfer of energy from one place to another and from one form to another. 
To avoid confusion, scientists discuss thermodynamic values in reference to a system and its surroundings. Everything that is not part of the system is part of the system's surroundings. Thus, there has to be a very clearly defined boundary to separate the system from its surroundings. Thermodynamics defines three types of systems, and the difference between them is given by the ability of the boundary to be permeable to matter, energy, and forces. In the case of an open thermodynamic system, matter and energy can pass through the system's boundary. If the boundary is impenetrable to matter, but it still exchanges energy with the surroundings, we talk about a closed thermodynamic system, while if the system is built in such a way that its boundary is rigid and immovable, it's not conducting any heat, it perfectly reflects all forms of radiations, thus, is impenetrable to all forms of matter, forces, and energies, we call it an isolated thermodynamic system. For example, we could associate the morning hot cup of coffee with an open thermodynamic system. The coffee from the cup would be the system itself, the cup would represent the system's boundary, while everything outside the cup, the system's surroundings. If we would cover the cup with a lid, we'd have something that resembles a closed thermodynamic system, while, if we would put the hot coffee in a thermos, we would have, generally speaking, an isolated thermodynamic system. Of course, this is just a simplification, because not even the coffee from the thermos flask or the covered cup cannot remain hot forever. Truth is that an isolated thermodynamic system exists only in theory, in scientists' imaginative thought experiments, in which certain aspects are examined intellectually, while many other complex aspects of reality are temporarily ignored. In our known universe, everything reduces to only two types of thermodynamic systems, open, or naturally occurring, and closed, or man-made, thermodynamic systems. Clement's apparatus, about which I talked in the first part of this series, is considered a closed thermodynamic system. So are a steam engine, a pressure cooker, an internal combustion engine, or the calorimeter used by Rubner to determine the energy value of protein, carbs, and fat. On the other hand, the human body continuously exchanges matter with the surroundings. Every single time you breathe, you inhale, along with the oxygen needed to survive, the water vapors from the air, viruses, bacteria, dust particles, microplastics, and so on, and you exhale mainly carbon dioxide. At the same time, the human body continuously exchanges heat, thus energy, with the surroundings. Moreover, unlike most closed thermodynamic systems, the human body can operate only in a very narrow band of temperatures. If any changes occur inside the body or in the surroundings, and we're talking about variations of temperature as small as 0.1 to 1 degrees Celsius, the body will rapidly exchange heat with the surroundings because it has to keep a constant core temperature of about 36 to 37 degrees Celsius. It is a well-known fact that even without suffering from an illness, every person begins to sweat if the temperature of the body rises by as little as 0.5 degrees Celsius and starts to shiver if the core temperature, or the temperature of the surroundings, drops with the same amount. Thus, by the well-established laws of thermodynamics, the human body is an open thermodynamic system, and not a closed one, as Rubner, Atwater, and many other nutrition scientists proposed. In fact, Atwater went so far in associating the human body with a closed thermodynamic system, that he even wrote that the amount of heat produced in the body is so large that has been calculated that, if there were no way for it to escape, there would be enough in an average well-fed man to heat his body to the temperature of boiling water in 36 hours. Again, Atwater's assertion is purely theoretical and has nothing to do with reality. There's no way for a human being to survive to the point that his core temperature would reach the temperature of boiling water. Constant exposure to temperatures of approximately 55 degrees Celsius leads to hyperthermia, while a prolonged exposure, longer than a few hours at this temperature, and up to around 75 degrees Celsius, leads inevitably to death. Nevertheless, by 1904, Atwater completed 72 experiments with nine different subjects in various conditions of diet, fasting, work, rest, sleep, etc., engaging in more or less active muscular or mental activity. All his experiments were carried out in violation of the basic principles of thermodynamics by associating the human body with a closed thermodynamic system and based on the assumption that, when coal is burned in a stove, heat is generated and a gas known as carbon dioxide is given off, together with water vapor. 
in exactly the same way, but less rapidly, when food is burned in the body, heat is generated, and water vapor and carbon dioxide produced, the heat being constantly radiated from the body, and the water vapor and carbon dioxide given off by the lungs and skin. He also performed many studies regarding the effects of alcohol on the human body and concluded that the body generates heat from alcohol much like it would generate heat from carbohydrates. He proposed that alcohol could be oxidized in the body and used as fuel for the human engine. This particular idea was often used later by the liquor trade in the promotion of alcohol. Before he died, in 1907, Atwater completed more than 500 energy balance experiments and published over 150 titles. He is considered today the father of modern nutrition research and education, and he is credited for laying the groundwork for the science of nutrition. His American adaptation of the German unit of energy is used today as a reference not only by the food industry but also by nutritionists and dietitians when devising individual diets and meal plans for schools, hospitals, prisons, nursing homes, and countless other public and private establishments. Nonetheless, albeit present today on almost all food labels and, arguably, the favorite unit of energy in common speech and public nutrition education, the nutritional calorie has not been defined anywhere in the scientific nomenclature. In 1948, at the Ninth General Conference on Weight and Measures, scientists adopted the joule as the unit for work, heat, and energy, avoiding the calorie as far as possible, and in all the countries that have adopted the international system of measurements, meaning all the countries around the world, except Myanmar, Liberia, and the USA, the energy is expressed primarily in kilojoules. So, before we figure out why scientists chose the joule instead of calorie as the unit for work, heat, and energy, and what's the difference between these two units of measurement, let's see how and why the U.S. government established back in the late 1960s the policy that led to 2,000 calories used today for general nutrition advice, meaning 2 million calories in Voigt's units of measurement, or 2,000 kilocalories, given that a 71-kilogram male who, during 24 hours, doesn't eat any solid food and drinks only about 1 liter of water, has an energy expenditure of 2,250,000 small calories, while a person who rides a medical bicycle for 8 hours a day has an energy consumption of 6,620 kilocalories per day.